Are you an adventurer looking to take your hunt to the next level? Then you're in the right place. Welcome to East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast. I don't know about where you're at, but here in northern Pennsylvania, it has been cold. Had some pretty cold weather here recently with some temperatures dropping down below zero, but it's allowed us to get out and do some ice fishing and some other activities to still get us outside. Been this is the first uh, year that I got into ice fishing a little bit, and I've done done pretty well uh, with the help of my cousin Mason and some others. Went out and caught some walleye, and uh, just yesterday I was I was sick, but my brother and my, my cousin Mason and Tyler had went out and they pulled in a, a really big uh, musky as well as some pike and some other um, great walleye. So got them filleted and uh, cooked up some of the the walleye and and the muskie. Awesome, awesome to eat there. I know a lot of people like to throw them back, but for me, uh, it tastes good, so why why not eat them when they're at the legal size? So that's about all that's been uh, going on here with the winter months. It's been everything's been pretty frozen. Haven't got out to do much scouting from the whitetail side of things. So been catching up on some business stuff and and uh, getting ready for three weeks here traveling for shows. So if you're going to be in the the Harrisburg, Pennsylvania area for the Great American Outdoor Show, which comes which opens up this Saturday here in February um, 2nd, I believe. And from so I'll be working that Saturday and Sunday, February 2nd and 3rd, and then the following Saturday and Sunday at the Great American Outdoor Show at the Maven Optics booth. So I've worked there with Maven for the last three years. And as you've probably seen through some of my pictures on social media and I've talked about it before on the podcast, I've used uh, Maven Optics for three years now and awesome stuff. So I'm, I'm happy to get to go back again, work with those guys, uh, probably record a podcast there with them. Um, check out some of the new stuff they have. And if you're in the area, swing by the booth and, and, uh, let's chat. Other than that, um, after that, I'll be heading up to Michigan, uh, to Manchester, Michigan, There's a a wild game dinner that I'll be doing a speaking event at talking about uh, the adventures of going out west and planning your first uh, do-it-yourself backpack hunt. So that'll be um, that'll be interesting. My first kind of speaking event at that of that level and I'll have some gear there and stuff that I'll be be selling. So I believe there's still some tickets available for that. Um, if you have any questions on it, reach out to me. Or if you go on the East Meets West Hunt social media page, you'll be able to find some information on that event as well. So that that is the weekend of February 16th in Manchester, Michigan. So if you're in the area there, you know, pick up a ticket and stop by for some food and and listen to me talk a little bit if you if you're not sick of hearing me on here. So with that being said, I have a great guest here on the the podcast today. I recorded this one quite a while ago with a friend of mine, Stefan Caperletti, and he's another Pennsylvania guy from down in the Hershey Harrisburg region. Recorded this one with him at the Total Archery Challenge last June and this this episode's a really really neat one. Um, kind of changed the way I thought about hunting in Africa, and it's you know it's the way Stefan went on this hunt was really interesting. And they did spot and stalk hunting rather than you know sitting in a ground blinder over a watering hole like I typically thought with Africa. And you know either way, I mean that's that's cool to get to go to an international place. But the fact that they were doing spot and stalk had really intrigued me. And when he started talking about this story to me, I was I I knew that I needed to get him on the podcast to talk about it. So without uh, further ado here, let's jump right into the podcast with Stefan. All right, guys, we're back for another episode of the East Meets West Hunt podcast, and I'm sitting here 
once again at the Total Archery Challenge, and it's still raining, with uh, Stefan Capriletti. Is, is that how you pronounce your last name? You nailed it, Bo. I got it. <laughs> awesome. So uh, Stefan and I met a few years ago at the ATA show and uh, in a bar. In a hotel bar. Imagine that. Yep. And uh, him and I have stayed in contact ever since. He's a, he's a local Pennsylvania guy here. Uh, a great dude, a, a sick ambassador. He's working the Total Archery Challenge here. And um, so, Stefan, what, what's going on, man? Not too much, Bo. Thanks for having me. It's uh, It's been a great weekend so far. Yeah. A little wet, but it's always a fun time here at the Total Archery Challenge. Yeah, man. Awesome event, right? Yeah, they put on just a great show every year. It seems to be getting bigger and bigger, and uh, it's something I look forward to coming to every year. Yeah. Awesome, man. So um, what so what do you do for a living? Well, I work for Kanadi Elite Taxidermy. Um, it's a studio located in central PA. Okay. Um, we're a pretty big taxidermy studio. We have about 15 full-time employees. And, uh, you know, we get to do taxidermy work for people around the country. Um, we get to go to a lot of cool places. We get to do a lot of cool projects. Um, and... It's just awesome seeing the different stories that come through our doors. Like, that's what I love about my job. It's the people that I get to talk to. Um, it's the hunts that I get to hear about. Um, and, I mean, it's it's after they've gone on a hunt of a lifetime. Yeah. You know, they're coming to pick up that animal that they work so hard for. And when they finally get to see it, you know, our, our slogan is relive the adventure. Okay. I was just going to, I was going to say, I thought it was something around, around reliving it. So, you know, they're coming in, they're, they're giving you every single detail of their hunt and, you know, they're, you know, either coming to pick up their piece or, or some, you know, we do a lot of deliveries too. Um, it's just, it's just an awesome aspect of my job because obviously they're so happy to get that animal finally back to their house. Yeah. Um, and just being able to hear how their trip started, um, how the trip was, how the hunt, you know, came together for them. And then, you know, that final piece of the puzzle is them getting, you know, their finished piece back, back into their arms. And it's just, the smile says it all. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, so that has to be awesome from you. Cause that's, that's gratification. One hearing about people and these amazing hunts. And then also, being able to, I'm sure it actually, it kind of sucks in a, a side of things because you're going to want to do a lot of these hunts that you see. And you guys My, do some freaking amazing different mounts. And The and, stories I've heard oh, just over the, I've worked for Kanadi now for about a year and a half now. And just some of the hunts that I've heard about. My list of hunts that I want to to get on and accomplish before my time on Earth is over. It's grown exponentially. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just it's been eye opening. Um, just to the different experiences out there. That I mean, you hear some of these stories, and it's just your jaw is on the floor. Yeah. Um, and it, it's, once again, it's just another cool aspect of the job, being able to talk to hunters and anglers around the world. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. And, um, so some of the, and when you said you do, you do mounts from people from everywhere. Yeah. So, I mean, you're doing exotic species, you're doing, you know, what just your, you know, your typical white tails, but from what my, I'm going to give you my firsthand experience with seeing like some of your work, especially at the Harrisburg show. It was the first time I saw it in person. I mean, the photos, which you, you take a lot of their photos, yep. right? Yep. Um, so when we get a finished piece there at the studio before the customer picks it up or, or we deliver it, um, we set up the lights there in the studio, get some awesome finished uh, photos of the pieces, and then, um, you know, use that for social media or our online catalogs and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's cool. And and as far as the, you do typical shoulder mounts, right? Yep. And then you do way more than that. Anything you want. Um, yes. You know, another, there is no such thing as a custom taxidermy mount from our studio. Um, in our opinion, stock is boring. Mm-hmm. Um, we d- we're not just going to show you um, taxidermy forms in a catalog and say, this one will be close um, to what your, your animal is. No, um, we get in your animal, we size it up, and we will tailor any taxidermy f- form out there to make sure that it is the size of your animal. Um, if you want a white-tailed deer jumping over the railing and you're upstairs of the house, we'll do that. Um, 
we recently finished up a baboon from Africa and got him a custom Notre Dame jersey. Oh, yeah? It's a gag gift that a guy wants to give to uh, to his buddy um, who hates Notre Dame. Mm-hmm. But he uh, he shot a baboon in Africa, brought it back <laughs> over, and uh, it's now wearing a Notre Dame jersey holding a football. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I bet that was a fun one to work on. As a Just uh, s- you see customers coming through the door, and that's one of the pieces they uh, they see. They're like, there's got to be a story behind that one. Oh, yes, there is, right? <laughs> so that that's awesome. And you, uh, so from that, you you were expa- explaining to me a little bit about a trip. Back in Harrisburg Back at, at the, the outdoor, show. Yep. outdoor show, you and I were talking, and you're like, I have an opportunity to go on a trip of a lifetime through basically through your taxidermy. And I didn't ask you how the trip went for a reason. I wanted you to lay it on me here. I want to get the, the, the real reaction. Cause from what, from my little bit that you have kind of hinted towards me, it was a really interesting experience. So back at Harrisburg, um, we had an outfitter from Africa, um, JP brand, of no sob hunting safaris. We've had a, we had a handful of clients that have gone through JP. Um, and JP has been coming to the Harrisburg show for 20 plus years. Great guy. Um, but coming in from Africa every year, he has a small 10 by 10 booth at the show, but he really wanted to, you know, spice it up a little bit, have some animals on display. It's just having to try to transport his mounts from Africa. It's costly. Yeah. Um, so, he basically said, I have the hunt of a lifetime for you. And, you know, I never really gave Africa a thought before this, but I said, okay, what do you got? Um, and basically it was an offer I couldn't turn down. Um, I didn't have a passport. I didn't know the first thing about, um, I'd never even traven, uh, traveled overseas. Yeah. Um, I had filed for my passport the next day. Okay. Um, and just, it's hard to put into words um, the planning process. JP was awesome, you know, helping me, you know, from from getting my passport to uh, telling me, you know, what flights I should be looking for um, to make it easier for us to get over there. Um, Because it is a long trip. I'm not a big fan of traveling, but... uh, but we threw, the, we threw this trip together in a couple months, which, I mean, most guys, when they're going over to Africa, they're planning this stuff out three, two you know, at minimum a year ahead yeah. of time. And uh, from Harrisburg till May, you know, we th- we threw this whole trip together. For what, three, four months at most? If that. Yeah. Um, so I was a little hesitant going in. Um, obviously, I'd never been there. Um, but, you know, JP was super helpful. You know, if I had a single question, you know, he would, he would email me the next day. Um, so mid-May... Uh, we left for Africa, and to put it simply, it truly was the hunt of a lifetime. Yeah. Um, to the point that I already want to go back. And this was something that you had said. I remember when your first reaction. So I was talking to you in Harrisburg, and you're like, you know, I have this opportunity. But, you know, I, I've never wanted to go to Africa, but I'm intrigued by it. And so what changed that, that, that you want to go back now after this experience? So kind of get into your, your traveling, you know, traveling out there and getting there. Let's, let's hear it. So we, uh, we flew out of Washington, DC, uh, Dulles international, um, seven and a half hour flight to London, red eye flight, got into London early in the morning. You know, you're dragging. Any red-eye flight's going to take the wind out of your sails pretty quick. Yeah. Um, so at this point, I'm like, oh, man, what am I doing? You know, did I make the right choice doing this? We're in London for nine hours for our layover and had to wait for our next red-eye flight into Johannesburg, South Africa. By the time I got to South Africa, I was, I was beat. And I was like, man... I hate flying. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it takes. Us. I couldn't imagine going that far. I'm a big guy, right? <laughs> Airplane seats are getting smaller and smaller. I felt like a sardine <laughs> in an aluminum box for for two days straight. Pretty much, we were flying. Um, but 
from Johannesburg, we had a two-hour flight over to Namibia. That is the country where we, we hunted. And um, when I finally got to get out of the airport, it was like, okay, I'm here. And this is pretty sweet. Um, we had a four-hour ride from the airport to camp. So a lot of traveling in two days. Um, but when we got to camp, when you get to to his place, it's still a six mile drive back, back to camp. And this is up and over sand dunes. It's wide open plains and, and driving in the amount of animals I saw was amazing. And, you know, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania. You're on game lands. You're happy to see a, a white tailed deer. Um, but over there, it's just, I can't explain it, but you know, you see a group of 300 spring buck, you know, a couple hundred yards away. You're, you drive a little further, there, there's a group of blue wildebeest. Um, driving in, we saw a huge sable bull 50 yards off the road. So I wasn't even there for a day, and the list of animals that I'd already seen, it blew me away. Yeah. You know, stuff that I'd never seen um, in person. It, I was standing right there in front of it. Um, and I was ready to get to work. Let's just put it that way. Yeah. Um, I took my wife, Laura with me. It was her first time, you know, in Africa too. And, you know, when we finally got to camp, it was, we got settled in, traveling was done, you know, it was time to enjoy ourselves, get ready for the hunt. Um, and we watched the sunset and they don't mess around when they, when an African sunset, they say is a little bit better. Um, it was picture perfect. I posted a, a photo of it on Instagram. Yeah, and it I, was, I, I remember seeing it, man. It was, uh, it was awesome. Yeah. So that that was your that was your first night in there. First night in there, yeah. Okay. Now, right off the get go of the trip, uh, we finally get there. We get settled in. I open my bow case. My bow sight was in three pieces. Holy I forgot. Shit. I didn't check it at the airport. I just wanted to try to get to camp. But I bring my bow halfway across the world. I get to camp. I open it, and I have set screws stripped out of the sight. My slider's snapped in half. There's five set screws missing, and it's just hanging off my bow. So my morale was pretty low. Um, I was going to use the rifle regardless for a couple of the, the animals that I wanted to get. Mm-hmm. But I really wanted to get after a lot of them with the bow. Yeah. Um, so I was a little ticked. <laughs> I would say. Um, you know, we're four hours from the nearest town. Um, the set screws aren't your, you know, basic size. Um, so pretty quickly I had to make the choice, well, there's just not going to be any bow hunting for this trip. So I was a little disappointed. So that that was that was kind of set the tone at the beginning. I'm sure I, I know if that happened to me, I'd be filled with anger and then straight to disappointment. Like just like why is this happening? Why British Airways? Why? So everyone contact British Airways, <laughs> let them know that they are anti hunting. I mean it lo- <laughs> it looked like a member of PETA grabbed my bow out of the case and smashed it against the floor. That is terrible. But I'm halfway across the world. Nothing you can do now. Nothing I can you do. You got to make the I, best I, of it. You know, we, how many times you know out there, whether it's backcountry bow hunting in, in Colorado or, you know, things do happen. Things can go south on a hunt, and it's either you tuck tail and and go home, or you adapt and you overcome any obstacle. Um, so I was like, well, the gun it is. Yeah, it's what I got to do. Yeah, you're there. You're there for you know a reason now, and you have to you finish the like, job. Yeah, you got to finish the job. That's all did. there is to it, and you did, huh? So, what what animals were you uh, were you pursuing for the most part? So we went over. Um, like I said, Laura came with me. Um, we were each going to try to shoot a spring buck. We were each going to shoot a gems buck, and then um, bare minimum, I wanted to shoot a kudu. So. Uh, day one, which would have been Sunday, um, we started with Laura. We we let Laura go to bat first, and uh, we decided to go after the spring buck. And I've watched Af- you know African hunts on TV and stuff, but 
you know, it never gives you a true definition of, of how the hunt's going to play out or, or what to truly expect. Um, you never truly know what's, how the hunt's going to play out until you're there and your boots are on the ground. And we chase spring buck all day. Um, they're a spooky animal. We, we put on seven different stalks and still didn't have, you know, one down. The trouble oh, so was... You, so you, were, you weren't sitting in a blind? No. Nope, this is all walking. Really? Yep. Okay, that's that's different. See, I wouldn't have expected right. that. If I would have had the bow, we yeah. would have we would have probably um, focused on some water holes. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a pretty effective method over there, especially now. Like Namibia has been in a drought for five years, so wow. you know, if you got a good water source, I mean, those animals need to come to the water to you know to drink. But my bow showed up in pieces, so that uh, you know that plan went out the door. Yeah. Sorry, I won't bring that up. <laughs> yeah. Let's try to move past that. All right. So, um, plan B, um, we would basically start, you know, start the day. We'd, uh, you know, it's, it's open plains. I mean, for as far as you can see, I mean, sitting here at, uh, you know, seven Springs, you know, we've got, we've got a big hill to our left. We've got a hill out in front of us. You can see for miles out there, no haze, blue skies, beautiful weather. And you can just, you can glass for miles. So, um, every morning we'd pretty much, um, you know, we're right on the fringe of the Kalahari Desert, so, you know, it's sandy. There's some sand dunes. And basically, that was a good elevation point that we started our day there and would glass for animals. So, you know, Sunday, seven different stalks and the spring buck, you know, you can find them in smaller groups. But for some reason, these spring buck were pretty herded up to the point where some of the bigger groups were 200 to 300 animals. And if one saw you, the whole group was gone in seconds. Wow. And it was, it was like, man, what gave us away? Um, just could super you, spooky. I was going to say, could you pinpoint it or was it just they were really aware? Just super aware. Uh-huh. The other problem is you're not just dealing with 300 spring buck. You know, there might be a group of zebras out there or, or wildebeest or, or impala. So it's not like you're sitting in a tree stand and, you know, you got to outsmart the eyes of a mature doe or a buck. You you have to outsmart 500 eyes. Yeah. So it, it was definitely challenging. And um, finally, you know, getting close to the evening there on the first day of the hunt, um, we were watching a big group of spring buck and a younger male was coming into the group and the spring buck that... Uh, we were after on that particular stalk chased the younger ram out of the group and gave Laura a hundred yard shot. So we didn't think we were going to, it was going to happen on day one. Luckily um, the mature ram was kind of being a little protective. Yeah. And uh, basically he ran right into our laps. So Laura put a good shot on him. Um, He ran 30 yards and down he was. So, not only did my wife shoot the buck I was after in the fall, she also drew first blood in, in Africa. <laughs> so she has she has more bragging rights. Oh now. yeah, she does. Um, I'm but, sure she lets you know. Yes, and everybody else. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> but I couldn't. I tell you what, I couldn't be prouder. It was, you know, we're in a different country, we're on a different continent, and you know, here she. She shoots a spring buck. And as scary as it is just thinking about that when he sits So back far from home. Yeah. There's there's no comfort to home right now. No. But it was such an awesome experience because if you would have asked me a year ago you ever think about, you know, hunting internationally or going to a different country, like I would have probably said no. Um and I don't know what changed my mind other than, you know, the, the offer was, you know, it truly was a trip of a lifetime. Um, but I'm just so glad that we did it because, you know, when Laura dropped her spring buck, you know, we're just standing around it, just seeing the smile on her face. I was, I was tickled. Um, it was just like, okay, this is going to be a good trip. Was it, so it was relatively open country? Very open. Um, you did have some brush to work with. Um, it was just few and far between. So, you know, if you were using the brush to kind of, you know, hide your stalk, 
I mean, you know the animals are out there. It's just, can you jump from this brush to that brush without them seeing you? Um, so it was completely different terrain, completely different country than, you know, what I'm used to here in the, you know, the, the big hardwoods of Pennsylvania. Like, completely different ball game. Yeah, so that just that completely changes that whole that whole dynamic as far as I'm, I'm sure it made you just a, overall. It helped make you a, a better hunter overall. I guess I, I was talking about this with a few other guys. Just like when you challenge yourself in different places like that, and you take little pieces from that that you learn, whether it's in Africa or you're in, and I, I, we'll, we'll get into it. But you're talking about potentially going to Colorado this year mm-hmm. to hunt elk. You could take little pieces of that from that stock that you Absolutely. can apply, Absolutely. and maybe adapt a little bit. But so uh, continue there. So let's let's hear. Did, did you do anything? Did you kill anything, or was it just day one? Wife? I didn't do anything. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just watched. Yeah. Um, day two, we went after Gemsbuck, and once again, never hunted a Gemsbuck in my life. Did as much reading and and, preparation as I could before going into the trip. But once again, didn't know what to expect. Um, Gemsbuck aren't as spooky as as Springbuck, in my opinion. But the the tricky part is, you know, we wanted to locate a mature bull. And from what JP taught me, like, you start in the middle of the group. So the Gemsbuck groups that we were coming across, you know, you're looking at 30 to 40 animals you know, all centralized in one location. So you start in the middle of the group and you're trying to find the the mature bull. The problem is over there right now, all the cows are pregnant, so they look huge. Like some of them dwarfed my bull. Wow. They're, they just, you know, they're, they're big. Um, but the other problem is we spotted my bull fairly quickly. It was just, he was surrounded by like 15 bodyguards. So we, we tried five, six different times to, you know, get a different angle, get a different vantage point, And each time I didn't have a clear shot at them. Um, they were kind of hunkered down in, in the brush. Um, they were feeding at the time. And so it helped us to be able to maneuver around them trying to get that shot. It just was not working out. Didn't matter if we moved 100 yards to the right or, or 200 yards to the left. I just couldn't get a clear shot without cows being in front of them, behind them. Um, luckily, we waited them out, and they started to move into the open country. And they came out one by one. So we waited, and uh, my bull gave me a nice clean shot at about a buck seventy-five. Um, one shot, down he ran. And... Uh, what, what what kind of emotions flowed through you at that point when you pulled that trigger and watched him go down? I've shot some animals in my life, Bo, and uh, walking up to that gems buck, when you, you see the size. Yeah. Um, you know, I've gone elk hunting a couple times. I haven't gotten one yet. Um, so I'm sure that that's going to be one of those experiences where you're just complete shock and all. Yeah. Um, but walking up to that gems buck, um, getting my hands on him for the first time, it was just like, I finally had my moment. You know, Laura had that moment the day before where she got her hands on the spring buck. Um, but I was like, I just shot a gems buck, you know, in Africa. And, you know, that's just, I'm still, I like, I've been home for a couple of days now. I still, I still feel like I'm there, but at the same time, it's like, okay, somebody going to pinch me and I'm going to wake up. Yeah. You know, it's still in that. It's like a dream. I don't know how you know else to put it, um, and it's just animals that you've never seen before. I mean, you've seen them on TV, you've seen them in magazines, but being national able to geographic see geographic national, <laughs> national de- you know all you know all those you know documentaries and stuff. But I was I was there, and it was mine. That is yeah, that right there. When you I I, I can picture it in my mind like you know walking up to it and just looking at it i would be just without without words i mean i can pull up some pictures here i mean that's the gems buck right there yeah i i saw that the photos when you had 
had posted him there. And I, I, I encourage anyone to go over to, to Stefan's uh, Instagram page and take a look at those photos. Just unbelievable animal. Th- those are, those are considered horns, correct? Yep, are sticking, yep. um, Pretty much just, anything in Africa. Um, they're all horns. Okay. Um, so, so you can't go shed hunting in Africa. No, you can't. I mean, it's a bummer. I mean, if we <laughs> I could, I mean, we trip. might book our plane tickets now. I was planning a trip for March. What do you um, think? <laughs> yeah. But, you know, the, this bull, they, they have a mage at like nine or ten years old. Really? So at that point, like, his horns were 39 inches in length, which is a super good bull. Um, but the older they get, they start to wear those horns down. To where they're a little bit more rounded at the top, um, but you could tell on mine like he he just had thick bases and you you know he could, you could tell um, there were some younger bulls in the group when we were glassing, but you could tell a difference in size just by his bases. Um, and you know just another that's just another cool thing about the hunt, just all the different information I learned. Yeah, um, you know hunting different animals that I never had, um, being in a different place. You know, you get to pick up all that information and, and, you know, learn it and bring that back home and be able to share that. It's, it's been fun. Yeah. That sounds, that sounds unbelievable. And then, so what, what happened, what happened, I guess, after, after the kill, what, what went on with, um, as far as I'm guessing that Kanati is going to be mounting the head was that, was the meat donated or did you get any of that or how does that work? Yeah. So, um, we caped it out. Um, we got it back to camp. And, you know, some guys, you know, they go over to Africa, they shoot this, you know, however many animals, and, you know, they can eat the meat, they can donate it to the local community or tribe. Um, I was fortunate enough that, you know, we we butchered all the stuff right there at camp, and I ate more meat in those 12 days than I... Than, than I can fathom. <laughs> Breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Spring buck meat, Gems buck burger, Gems buck steaks, kudu, zebra, impala. It was just being able to try all the different you know types of meat, cuts of meat. Um, I still ended up leaving some meat behind. Um, we donated some to to the trackers that helped us on the hunt and their families. Um, but man, we put a dent in, in what we shot. We, yeah. uh, we Was it a good? G- delicious. Awesome. That's, that's, that's cool to hear. I, I, I had never talked to anyone who has eaten any African wild game before. So that's why I was there really wasn't, interested. There wasn't a piece of meat I ate over there that I didn't like. Um, kudu tongue. Really? Awesome. Um, Gam's buck burger. It's a little fattier than, than deer venison. Okay. So it holds it hold together a little bit it better? It holds, holds together a lot better. We, his, uh, JP's wife, Karita, made us burgers that, I'm not kidding you, that big. You know, half the size of a football. Yeah. It took me an hour to eat. But delicious. <laughs> Gamma's Buck Country Fried Steak. Gam- <laughs> I like it. Man, that, that, that whole culture experience that you had there is is one that you just can't I'm sure it's hard to even articulate on this podcast to be able to explain pictures would be like. the only way that I could even do any of it justice yeah. like I took some some pictures of the stuff we ate just just to be able to remember it um but I mean I don't know how many of those country fried gems buck steaks I had but I know it was a lot <laughs> it was uh, enough I mean, four or five helpings I said okay I need to I need to cut this out yeah um <laughs> we took the meat right close to the bone on, on, on our one spring buck and they made a spring buck pot pie. They call it a game pie over there. It's a pretty popular meal. Um, delicious, nice, juicy spring buck meat with about an inch, uh, inch layer of, uh, like a pot pie crust. Delicious. Really? Um, it was just, sounds awesome. Mouthwatering. I want to send Laura back over there for a couple months to take cooking lessons. It was that good. <laughs> what did she say when you told her that? She gave me that look that she normally does. Like, hey, I'm going to punch you quick here if you don't shut yeah. up. Did, did, did she hit you? 
but I don't. I'd rather not talk about that on okay. the podcast. All right, all right, all right. We'll, we'll talk about that's this that's for Doc, Doctor Finkelstein and me <laughs> to discuss later on. You're getting watery eyed, you know. <laughs> All right, sorry, Laura. <laughs> but we're really not sorry, Laura. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, anyways, yeah. Okay. That that's that's cool. And so that's what, you know, the the misconception with hunting Africa is. You know, people go over, you know, spend a bunch of money. They just shoot stuff for things on the wall. Yeah, yeah. They go over. They're just dropping every animal that they see. You know, the meat just stays out there in the open plains to rot. That's not the case. I mean. And you're, you're eating the tongue, and, you're, ate, give, and you're giving away anything that you couldn't use or, yeah. you know, get. That's that's what people don't understand. That's that's awesome to to hear that from someone that I know closely that is that has just experienced that as of days ago. Right. And fr- from what I learned and, and from what, you know, JP told me over there, that is just the culture over there. Like, nothing goes to waste. Um, which, you know, honestly, I think, I think uh, we could learn some things over here you know in, in the us of a um america america you know whether we're talking about garbage or, or anything like americans would like to waste stuff and just you know be in a different country and see how they do things a little differently and you know how they're a little bit more efficient with with what gets thrown away and what gets used um you know once again it was eye-opening wow to, yeah to, to see that culture is it's is something that the more you talk about is something that I'd love to experience sometime. And, and it, I, I never had any, you know, want to, I'd never wanted to go to a different country for anything, to be honest with you. Neither did I. And the more I talk about, it, I was talking to a guy, Matt comment, a good friend of mine on the podcast here, and he's heading over to, to mid middle Asia to hunt Ibex. Yep. And, uh, he was telling me about it. He goes, I just, he goes, I never really thought about it. And he goes, I just got this bug and I want to do it. And I can't wait to hear about like, you know, that experience or just experiences. And, and the one person who is probably one of the only people I've seen really articulate that well is Jim Shockey. Yeah. He, it's about everything. The culture, the hunt is part of it. It's a part of it, but it's, it's what he experiences, you know, on these different hunts, the different cultures, the different people, um, and like I said, I was never really interested in that. But when I was there in Africa, like I can remember, like we got uh, we got the Gemsbuck to the truck. We loaded it up, and I, I I remember it like it was yesterday. I'm I'm standing in the back of of the Land Cruiser. I'm looking down at the Gemsbuck I just shot. You know, I'm an emotional high. I'm just rested on the truck. It's a beautiful day. We're driving down a, a backcountry road in nowhere in Namibia. And it's just like, this is an awesome experience. What else is out there that I've been missing out on, not going and doing? And how can I change that? And, you know, what else can I go see? Yeah. Um, So you need to go. I need to go. (sighs) Thanks for adding another one onto the list. Yeah, put that on the list a while. Okay. All right. What about, uh, so, okay, let's fast forward a little bit. Now you're back. You're here. You're at the Total Archery Challenge, and you told me you're planning on you're you're considering going to um, a Western state to hunt the mighty Wapiti. Yes. Again, is this your third time? <sighs> It'd be my second. Okay. Um, went out in 2015 on our honeymoon. That's what I'm talking about. She wanted to get married. I wanted to go elk hunting. We compromised. <laughs> 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 so. Took the bow. We went to Montana, um, hunted there at the base of the Crazy Mountains, if you're familiar with that. Um, awesome hunt. We saw a ton of elk. It was just um, some cold weather had pushed them down out of the mountains, and they were in open country. And Was know, it private land that they were going on to? Yeah. Okay. Um, we had some chances, but with the bow, I didn't get closer to the herd bull than 115 yards. It was just super tough. They were in the wide open. We had a few, uh, a few drainage ditches and stuff, and and you know we made a couple moves. We just could never get close enough, you know, where they were, you know, that week. Um, but from the first bugle, you're hooked. It was. I mean, I went home empty-handed, but it is one of uh, it's one of my favorite hunts that I've been on. Just the amount of elk we've seen. You know, just. It was my first time hunting in Montana. Um, just 
be a beautiful place. I, I love it out there. Um, so I told myself after that, I'm going to go back every year. I'm going to go back every year. And then life happens and you get busy with work and everything else that goes on. Um, but this year I, I really am trying to get back in September. Um, probably Colorado. Nice. But anyways, no, Colorado is a beautiful state, the land of opportunity, many, you know, things to do, uh, many places to hunt. And yeah, I, that would be pretty awesome for you to go there. And whether you get it done or not to be able to go to two different places like that in one year. I'm, wow. I'll be, I'll be scrounging for vacation time. Yeah. Um, but I'm trying, I'm trying my darndest to make it work. Um, I'll give your boss a call and we'll see what we can do. Yeah. Wes, if you're listening, I just need a couple more days. <laughs> Two more days, Wes. Yeah. That's all he needs. I'll work weekends. <laughs> all right. I'll 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 make sure I send him this in an email a link. Yep. So he can listen for Don't it. Don't fire me. Yeah. You know, he's not saying anything bad about you on the podcast. Just best job I ever had. <laughs> no, that's that's awesome, man. That, that's pretty cool to be able to do that. So I'm also going to go to Ohio again this year. I've done that the last five I think you years. You did pretty good last year, didn't you? I I did. Yeah. I did okay. Yeah. Well, I, what was it? Two buck in two days or something like that? Two buck in three days. Yep. Pennsylvania and Ohio, um, both uh, mountainous train bucks, I guess you want to call them, and uh, hill country bucks. And it was it was freaking awesome, awesome experience. Yeah. So. See, and another thing I'm looking forward to is now in, in Pennsylvania, that first week in November, we have, you know, a bear, deer, and turkey overlap. We do. So that's, I want to go to Colorado, but I also want to leave enough vacation time to take advantage of that first week. Mm-hmm. Um, you go upstate somewhere, uh, you know, north central Pennsylvania, and uh, just hunt some mountain deer, maybe get a shot at a bear, maybe bag a fall turkey. Um, Triple trophy in one week? Triple you trophy in one week. You heard it here on the podcast. <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. It's already done. It's done. But uh, actually, it's funny because last year was the first year they did that bear mm-hmm. season in the first week of November. And I was like, at first I was kind of bummed. I'm like, I wish they'd do it the first couple of weeks of the season when we had apples and everything right. where I usually see the bears. I'm like, I never see them then. Well, this year, the day after that closed, it was like November, I don't remember, 4th or 5th, somewhere around there, I had uh, – I had a big one come out right in front of me at 15 yards in front of my stand. And I just had to sit there and look at it. I mean, it was literally like that. I think this, it closed on Saturday. It was on Monday when I had that encounter. It's always how it goes. Yeah. And I'm like, no, like this isn't even funny. No, that, that, uh, they had a lot of guys shoot an archery bear last season. Yeah. Moving that week up. I mean, it was, yeah, everybody's kind of in the same boat. It's it's how many vacation days do you want, do you want to spend? Yeah. And, uh, given the guys the option to, to use a vacation day where they can shoot three different animals. Um, it helps. Yeah. And, and we're, we're all, you know, working class guys here. So we, we got to use that sparingly, you know, for family and, and, and hunting. And if you combine the two, that's cool too. So, which seems like you've been able to work out a little bit. So far, so good. That's what I like to hear. That's what I like to hear. What, what else? Uh, so you're from Pennsylvania and, um, you're from right around the Harrisburg area, correct? Yep, Harrisburg, Hershey, PA. Yeah, and and from and you killed a bear this past year. I did, yeah. Um, so, you know, we have the archery bear season. Didn't have any luck then. Um, and typically for the the four day uh, rifle season, we go up to to our friend's camp in Tioga County, Pennsylvania. Um, didn't have any luck the first day. We got some snow Sunday night into Monday. I, I tracked a bear all morning, and he ended up heading to uh, some private ground. So, you know that that scratched that. Um, we had a we had a slow slow rifle season this year across the state. Um, bad weather on opening day, um, but luckily where I hunt at home for deer um, in uh, management unit four C, they are part of the extended bear season there that comes in that first week of rifle. So from that first Wednesday in rifle season to Saturday, you know, we get a couple more days to try to, to bag a bear. And on the last day of the extended season, I shot a 215-pound sow. Yeah. Um, another awesome hunt. Yeah, and, and if I remember right, you were – I'm not trying to get real 
close on locations here, but the Appalachian Trail runs through where you're at, yep. right? Yeah, we are. It's right there. It's right in my backyard. Yeah. Um, so I was, you can't hunt up by the Appalachian Trail. There is a, a safety corridor. Okay. Um, but I was 400 yards away. Okay. You know, from, from that corridor um, on top of the mountain and all the way on top. Then I shot her, and then I realized where I was. It, the funny thing that I, I laughed when you when you posted the, the photos of that bear and everything in the time, I was like, does he know bear season's not in? Like, <laughs> I, I didn't know that those management units yeah. could hunt bear. I was like, what's he doing? Like, <laughs> <laughs> Stop it. You're, Just you're, breaking, bear, you're breaking the rules. You're burying yourself, man. Yeah. But no, that that was that was super cool to do that, and and is, is that do they have that open down there because of the bear population being high, or what is the reason for that? Do you know? So I'm trying to think. It's it's four C. Has it always been that way? F- only in the last couple years. Okay. Um, a couple years. I mean, time's flying by. It's probably been five, six, seven years now. Um, but yeah, like four C, five B. Um, I think any of those areas down there in that part of the state where you're starting to get into more denser population areas um, of people, we have seen an increase of bears kind of moving in. And now, you know, like I said, we're right there at the base of the Appalachian Mountains. So, I mean, it's not like it's not bear country, but I mean, we're starting to see bear um, right outside of towns that have never seen a bear. Um, This past, what was it? It was like November, December. It was right. It was right after I shot my bear. They had to pull a bear, bear, a younger bear, a juvenile bear, out of a tree, um, right outside of Lebanon, PA. Lebanon, PA is a pretty big. I mean, I'd call it a big town that's classified as a city. Um, but you're starting to see more and more of that in you know South Central PA, and I think um, that's one of the big reasons why they have the extended seasons now. Okay, that that's cool. Yeah, that was that was awesome. So you you've been on a roll here. So let's let's keep it going, buddy. What do you I think? Shot my bear. Shot a spring turkey opening day. Okay. Yes. Um, it's been it's been a great couple months of hunting for sure. Awesome. Uh, I mean, obviously, a- Africa's icing on top of the cake. Um, but now we just gotta get through the summer months here and, and get back into the full swing of the season. Whether it's Colorado for elk or you know when when uh, archery opens up here in the state, it's uh, it's just always a fun time. All right, dude. Well, I have I do have one question for you. Something I've been asking everybody here. If if you uh, turn around and look at my my banner here behind you, how do you define adventure? How do you define adventure? Yeah, that is a nice photo, by the way, man. You like that? Is that from Colorado? Yes, it is. Last year? Yep. Yep. That's me bugling down there. I had my dad snap the photo. You're looking good. Thanks. How do I define adventure? Um, Are you looking I, at my ass? <sighs> Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think it's just getting out there, getting out of your comfort zone and giving it your all. Um, you know, Africa was an adventure for me. It was out of my comfort zone. I was traveling internationally. It was something that I never really wanted to do, but it was something that I felt I needed to do, like for my soul. If I, if yeah. I say, you know, it just... We only have so much time here on the earth, and I hate I hate seeing people just wasting time because time's all we got here. Um, and money and all that goes away, but the only thing that that's really truly important is time. Time, your, your memories, the experiences that you have. So, how do I define adventure? I would just say, getting out of your comfort zone, lacing up the boots, and going out the door. I love it. I love it. That, that's what I like to hear right there. Um, all right, and uh, last thing I, I want to let the listeners know before they check you out on you know your social media pages and everything, which you take amazing photography, by the way. But um, you'll notice that Stefan has grown some long hair that I like to call the lion's mane. And uh, in Africa, he, <laughs> he, he actually – tell him what you did. Uh, I chased the uh, the big lions out of there and 
took over their prides. <laughs> so we're going we're gonna to leave you with that. And uh, Stefan, we're... If, if any of you out there are visualizing that right now, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Visualize it before you, before you take a look at his pictures. So. I think I'm going to Photoshop myself on top of Pride Rock tonight, <laughs> and I'll send it your way. Can you please do that? I'll post it up. <laughs> but anyways, where can people find more of you and what you're, up, what you're about? Uh, like you said, Instagram, uh, at Stefan Caproletti. I'm on Facebook, you know, send me a friend request. I love networking with, with, uh, with hunters, anglers, anybody who shares the same passion that we do. It's just awesome to be able to talk to different people from around the country. You know, like I said, it all comes back to, to being able to share and, and talk about those different experiences that we, that we get out in the field every day that we're, we're truly blessed to see and witness. So, um, look me up. Let's talk hunting. All right, man. And uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. And remember, Bo knows. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of East Meets West Hunt with your host, Bo Martonic. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit eastmeetswesthunt.com, Facebook at East Meets West Outdoors, and Instagram at East Meets West Hunt. If you enjoyed today's episode, please review and subscribe, and we'll catch you next time.